session and welcome you to uh, this public session of the Owens Lake Scientific Advisory Panel. I'm going to read some uh, prepared remarks. I'm Dave Allen, the chair of the panel. Uh, the panel's work is being conducted under the auspices of the National Academy of Sciences in response to a request from the Great Basin uh, Unified Air Pollution Control District and the LA Department of Water and Power. Uh, the panel has been asked to evaluate the effectiveness of alternative dust control measures for their degree of reducing particulate matter emissions from the Owens Lake bed and reducing the use of water and control emissions. I would like to emphasize that the panel is focused on conducting science and engineering evaluation. Uh, the panel will have no direct involvement in designing or implementing dust mitigation plans. Panel statement of task and other relevant materials are available on a outside this room. Um, today, the panel will hear a series of presentations. I'll note that we're on a, a pretty tight schedule, so I'm going to hold everyone to uh, their allotted time. Uh, we'll hear a series of presentations that are relevant to its task. Uh, I'd like to emphasize to everyone that this is an information gathering session. That is, the panel is in the process of collecting information that will consider in the course of making its scientific conclusions and recommendations. Therefore, I ask everyone here today to be extremely mindful of the fact that the panel has not completed its deliberations. Comments made by individuals, including members of the panel, should not be interpreted as the positions of the panel or the National Academy of Science. In addition, some questions asked by panel members during these information gathering sessions are intended to probe a topic and may or may not be indicative of their personal views. Once the panel's draft report is written, it must go through a rigorous peer review process before a draft is considered a National Academy of Sciences report. Therefore, observers who draw conclusions about the panel's work based on today's discussion will be doing so prematurely. I want to note that this entire session is on the record and is being recorded. Each presenter will be asked to provide remarks, and then panel members will have the opportunity for follow-up discussion. However, because of time limitations, the panel and presenter should not be expected to entertain questions from members of the public. Near the end of today's session, uh, at 5 o'clock, members of the public will have the opportunity to provide comments. If you're interested in making comments, we ask that you sign up at the information table, again, just outside this room, um, by 4 p.m. today. Uh, for those joining the meeting online, if you would like to make a comment, please sign up by 4 using the chat feature uh, online and send a message under the heading, Ask Questions Here. Each speaker uh, should plan on taking no more than a few minutes. Also, anyone who wishes to submit written comments uh, or other materials that are relevant to our charge should contact Ray Wassel. Ray, would you raise your hand? Uh, the responsible staff officer for this study. Uh, before we begin the presentations, I'll ask the panel members to introduce themselves to the audience and indicate their affiliations and relevant area of expertise. I'll begin. Uh, I'm Dave Allen. I'm the chair of the panel. I'm from the University of Texas at Austin and I have a, a broad array of air quality management experience. I'm Pratik Baswas, Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, my expertise is in aerosol science and technology and uh, focus here on uh, particle control technology. I'm Ted Russell uh, from Georgia Tech, and I actually started particulate matter modeling in California about 40 years ago and been doing it ever since. I'm Nusha Rajani, I direct the Urban Water Policy Program at Stanford University. Uh, my expertise in hydrology and water resource management uh, and water energy management. Um, Greg Okim, Department of Geography, uh, professor and chair, uh, mostly study dust emission processes uh, and aeolian processes in the presence of vegetation. Good morning, I'm Stephanie Johnson with the National Academy of Staff and the Water Science and Technology Board. Ray Wassel, I'm the responsible staff officer. And Cliff Duke, I'm director of the Academy's Board on Environmental Studies and Public Policy. Akula Venkatram from UCLA uh, Science. My expertise is in uh, dispersion of dust. Scott Van Pelt with the uh, USDA Wind Erosion Water Conservation Research Laboratory. 
my area of expertise is the emission processes chemistry. And can we have the people on the phone introduce themselves, please? The panel members. Yeah, this is Scott Tyler with the University of Nevada, Reno, the Department of Geological Sciences and Engineering. Uh, my focus is on uh, near surface hydrology, transport, transport of energy, water solutes uh, across the land atmosphere interface. And uh, uh, I have worked down at Owens Lake about 20 years ago working on uh, understanding the evaporation rates and water balances on the lake bed itself. I'm Ruya Barini from Environmental Sciences at UC Riverside. My research is focused on understanding <laughs> sources, their precursors, and transformation pathways in the atmosphere. Okay, great. Thank you all for those introductions. We're going to proceed immediately to the agenda. I know we're already uh, five minutes behind by my watch. Uh, so what we're going to do is hear from three speakers. In the interest of uh, time, uh, we're going to have the three speakers make their presentations, uh, and then we'll follow that by questions for all three speakers at the end of that. And so we're going to be targeting uh, getting to the questions by 11.20. Uh, so uh, the speakers will still have the time that they were initially allotted. Our first speaker is the Air Pollution Control Officer from the Great Basin Unified District, uh, Philip Cadu. Thank you, Dave. Good morning, everybody, members of the Academy, Scientific Advisory Panel, Great Basin staff, PWP staff, some members from the state of California, members from our sovereign nations, also the public. Good morning. So I've got a lot to cover. Um, you can probably, I'm um, really fast, squeeze about a year into each minute. I have 25 <laughs> minutes, so it'll be a fun presentation. But it's a good overview, and it'll give you a good history, a brief history of the timeline, the regulatory timeline and the dust control implementation timeline. Again, my name is Phil Cadu. I'm the Great Basin Unified Air Pollution Control Officer. I'm the Executive Officer, the Director, the General Manager of the agency. I oversee all functions and operations of that agency. Great Basin is a regional government agency. We're comprised of three counties. We're a unified air district. And our mission is very simple. It is to protect the public health from the harmful effects of air pollution. And in that mission, we also have the responsibility to protect the environment as well. Great Basin is a unique air district. There's not a lot of unified air districts in the state of California. And our legal authority comes under the Federal Clean Air Act. And it also comes under state law. The Air District story is quite fascinating because we're, it's, the Clean Air Act is a sub-cooperative federalism structure. So the federal government said, we're going to regulate air quality. We're going to set these standards, but we don't have the resources to enforce it. The state's going to do that, and the state did the same thing, and they delegated that authority to the counties. Well, in rural California, the counties didn't have the resources either, and that's why we unify. If we were the size of a state, we'd actually be the ninth smallest state in the country. Let's just give you a geographic overview of what the Great Basin is. So Great Basin is a watershed where there are no outlets from the tributaries to the ocean. And the Great Basin Air District, which is just a California air basin, um, sits on the eastern side of California, and we have um, two unique sources of pollution that make our air district unique. Um, one source, Mono Lake, and then another source, Owens Lake. What makes these unique is Owens Lake is actually the country's largest source of PM10 pollution in the country, and it's controlled. And Mono Lake uh, is now currently the largest active source of air pollution in the country, seven years running. One thing unique about the tributaries and lake systems in the Great Basin is that they don't drain to the sea, so they are strictly rely on those tributary inputs and evaporation to maintain lake level. This is a picture of Owens Lake taken in 1891, looking towards the Sierra Nevada, along the shoreline of Keeler. It's a 110 square mile lake, with about 50 feet deep, arguably 90 if you measure the thickness of the mud. Um, just to put that into perspective, if you had a kitchen table and put a penny on it, the kitchen table surface area is the surface area of Owens Lake, and the thickness of the penny is the depth of it. So it puts it into scale a little bit. Owens Lake was a lake that was navigable. There were steamships that hauled silver ore from Sierra Gordo over to ports on the other side and down to San Pedro. 
Um, some claim that the mines at Owens Lake were the mines that built Los Angeles. And something changed. And this was in 1913. What had changed was the city of Los Angeles built the Los Angeles Aqueduct. And that Los Angeles Aqueduct purpose was to supply the growing city of Los Angeles with water. As a consequence, the water that arrived in LA in 1913 that provides today millions of water with the most cleanest and reliable drinking water for the city of Los Angeles ended up resulting in the desiccation of Owens Lake. The desiccation of Owens Lake is why we're here today. Here you can see some of the surfaces and surface conditions at different times of the year. Some of the huge crust surfaces that you can get. And then also in the bottom right, you can see a picture of Owens Lake prior to any dust controls where there's about a 10 square mile area of PM10 emissions. So quite a large source area. It's one of the more emissive areas or was before control. And it's what we call the North Sand Sheet. Just kind of put that into perspective. You're looking at about 65 miles of Sierra Nevada crest there and just the northern portion of Owens Lake. This is what a PM10 event looks like at Owens Lake. We're going to get to this specific area in about slide 17. But the, put this into perspective as the largest source of pollution in the country. You know, what were and how large were those PM10 events? Well, there's different ways you can measure it. You can measure it on a 24 hour level. Those are the clean air laws, 150 micrograms per cubic meter. You can measure the severity of it based on the frequency. You can measure the severity of it based on the order of magnitude. So we would have up to 45 exceedances at the federal level per year. That's the frequency. We'd have concentrations of up to 20,000 micrograms per cubic meter per day. And to put that into perspective, especially for members of the public that don't deal with micrograms and cubic meters and those types of units, um, if you're exceeding the law, which is the law, 150 micrograms per cubic meter, and you're doing that 100 times over, the equivalency of that is you were pulled over by a highway patrol in a 65 mile an hour zone, and he asked you how fast you were going, you have to tell him you're doing about 6,500 miles an hour. So if you were trying to get out of the ticket by telling him you're late to dinner for grandma's pot pie, you're probably not going to be too sympathetic. It's um, you know, an endangerment to public health, it's an endangerment to society, to yourself. So that kind of puts the problem into perspective. <laughs> The regulatory timeline really begins with the air district formation in 74. And then there's something that happened in 1983, and that was a legislative action at the state of California level that implemented the Health and Safety Code 14316. And what this did for the first time was it decided that the city of Los Angeles was actually responsible for the PM10 emissions at Owens Lake because the water diversions. It was determined to be an anthropogenic cost meaning that it was man-made, and they were going to be the responsible party. We'll get to this in the next couple of slides, because it's, little, it's pretty important to understand, because normally air pollution control laws work differently. They work based on, on ownership and property ownership. And one other special thing about the laws is that this pollution source predated the Clean Air Act. So today, if somebody wanted to build a coal fire power plant in downtown Los Angeles, they'd have to go to the South Coast to get a permit. And they wouldn't be able to build that facility until they could already meet the requirements to prevent emissions that would impact public health. Owens Lake had already been doing that. It had been doing it for 100 years. And so we had to develop controls that can bring that source under the federal and state regulations. And so my staff, Grace, Dr. Grace Holder and Ann Logan will be talking about that later today. So it's an important thing to understand. There are a lot of special circumstances at Owens Lake, one of them being that the federal clean air mandate doesn't need to be met anywhere at Owens Lake except the 3600 elevation line. The PM10 standard of 150 micrograms was promulgated in 87, and then the Owens Valley planning area was designated on attainment. What this meant was that the Great Basin Unified Air Pollution Control District had to develop a plan to control the source of emissions. And so our first plan was written in 1987. This is the serious non-attainment designation boundary for Owens Lake. It goes from south of Tenemaha just to Haley, and I think it's the central Haley, but it may be south into Haley. Um, it gives you a little bit of perspective of the geography. We're bound um, by three mountain ranges. On the west, we have the Sierra Nevada. On the east, we have the Inyo Mountains and the Coastal Mountains. 
And the prevailing meteorological patterns are north and south winds, depending on the time of year. It's like uh, somebody breathing very deeply through a straw. That's how the winds move through the Owens Valley. And this is just normal. This is the environment. So land ownership plays an interesting piece to the puzzle because the EWP responsible for the controls has to get the permission of the landowners to implement the controls. So as you can see, the state of California has, I'm going to throw this out, it's about 95% of the ownership of the lake bed. The EWP has some, the Bureau of Land Management has a little bit, and there's some private end holdings um, on the south end, uh, water, crystal geyser, and the duck club. So primarily, it's state property. And in the early days, deciding how the controls are going to be put into place, what controls are going to be used. Um, it was important to understand what the landowner was going to accept, what DWP can implement, and the things that the scientific advisory panel is going to be considered in alternative dust control technologies. In 1998, this was Great Basin's estimate of the areas that needed control. It's actually 46 and a half square miles. And I think this was put together with cardboard and Xerox on like a light bulb or something. It was pretty cool. All right. The good stuff. So we get into the regulatory timeline. You keeping track of time, Anna? Okay. Um, all right. There's a lot of good stuff here. Uh, the blocks of dust control implementation are really important. Maybe understanding all of those specific intricacies of them are not so much. But what's really key here, and I'll try to highlight some of the brief components of each block, is the 1998 SIP. NAD actually provided a state implementation plan for the first time that had been approved by the Environmental Protection Agency, that had been approved by the state of California, that said, yes, this plan is going to work. There are areas um, for dust control, and that was 16.5 square miles. In that plan, there were provisions to build out dust control to about 30. In the 2003 plan, there was a provision for, over time, developing supplemental control measures or deciding what areas needed additional controls. And there's really specific procedures in our implementation plan of how that's done. Uh, we collected uh, four years of data and the dust control area grew. We had a settlement agreement with DWP, subsequent SIP that incorporated all of these provisions and the dust control was built out to 43 miles. After the 2008 SIP, following the same provisions for supplemental control determinations in 2011, the district ordered additional controls. 2011 and 2012 added 3.62 miles. 2013 added zero. We didn't find any additional areas. We had a modified stipulated order of abatement that required two additional square miles of control in the north end of the lake. We had a Keeler Dunes settlement where the district received $10 million in funds to do a Keeler Dunes dust control project. And then in 2014, we had a stipulated judgment. The stipulated judgment and the 2016 SIP is what we'll talk about most of today because that is where we are and how we look into the future and how we regulate Owens Lake as a dust source. There's also another, it's Rule 433, and that's a component of our 2016 SIP, and that's the federally enforceable mechanism um, of the state implementation plan. This brought Owens Lake 48.6 square miles for control, however, 1.2 square miles are deferred for controls at this time because of sensitive resource areas. The map obviously doesn't add up. Um, DWP, as they have built controls, are actually a little larger in some areas and smooth boundaries. So we actually have 47.8 square miles of dust control. So this is what it looked like. 1998, 16 and a half square miles, the most emissive areas on the lake, North Sanchee, South Sanchee. The 29.8 in 2003. And Jaime Valenzuela is going to give a presentation actually talking about DWP's phases of these projects later this morning. The 2005 Supplemental Control Determination Settlement Agreement, 2008 SIP. That was 43 square miles. The 2011 Stipulated Order of Abatement as this two square miles of gravel, the north end of the lake, and that's where the photo of the PM10 event was from pretty much that area. And then we have all of these other steps, the additional supplemental control determinations, modified sick later of abatement, QWD settlement, and then SIP, SIP judgment, and this is where we are, 47.8. There's the center of the lake. There are no controls required for that area. DWB actually does not need to ever control those areas as part of the stipulated judgment. It's the brine pool. That's what's left of Owens Lake. There's still water there. 
around the edges of the lake. A lot of that area is naturally controlled with vegetation and seeps and springs. And the question everybody always asks, are we done? Are all the dust control areas controlled? And it's a really difficult question to answer. Um, it's not that I don't want to answer that, it's just a difficult question. What you're looking at here is all of the dust observations. So we've had staff for a quarter century looking at the dust plumes at Owens Lake and they go out to these observation points and delineate these areas. And this is what they've seen over that quarter century. And you can see we've captured most of the areas. Um, and the focus here was really on the lake. We have some additional off-lake areas like the Keeler Dunes and Alantia Dunes, some other sources over by Flat Rock where we have some depositions. And you know, one thing to put into context here is that Owens Lake was a source of emissions for a century, and those emissions have depositions, secondary deposition along the shoreline, and those deposition zones are still there, um, and still there are emissions associated with those. This is what it looks like. It is um, a piece of artwork. <laughs> it is uh, the eighth wonder of the world. Um, it's the dust control that Owens Lake is an engineering marvel. Um, and one of the most successful air pollution control stories, I think, in the history of this country. It is the largest source of air pollution control and pound for pound, one of the cheapest control measures that's ever been implemented for fugitive dust emissions. Uh, the specifics of these controls we'll get into much later. And all right, uh, are we done? Are all areas controlled? This is just looking at potential emissions. And the reason why I'm using potential emissions versus annual emissions, which is how regulatory agencies normally look at emissions, is because the annual emissions change. The lake's very dynamic. Um, they're not the same. They will change if it's a windier year. They'll change if it's a drier year. They'll change if there's precip at different times of the year. Um, crust surfaces will form at temperatures that are maybe hotter earlier in the year than previous year. So it's very, very dynamic. What this does is it looks like at all of the areas that have ever been emissive. I don't want to late. In 2011 was when this analysis was done. And so when we talk about tons of emissions, we potentially could have seen 240,000 tons of PM10 annually from Owens Lake. The most we've ever measured is about 76 tons, 76,000 tons per year. So this is where we are today, about 2,600 tons a year of potential emissions. And so some years we see it, some of that, and some years we don't. We haven't seen a lot of new areas open up since 2016. We've seen some areas open up that haven't been emissive for a few years. And we've seen some areas actually open up more significantly than we've seen in a long time, but they're not real large. So what do future dust control source areas look like? And this is a map from our 2006 settlement discussions with DWP and identifying areas that require controls, that might need controls, and definitely won't need controls. The take home here is you can look at some of the areas like Wahoo, and this is a, a low priority. We're not going to need emission controls there. You see Cottonwood. Cottonwood's low. Um, there's some other areas at the north end of the lake. And then you look at a similar map that we made for remediation in 2011, and those areas have actually changed. Um, Wahoo's now, maybe. Uh, you get some of the areas by the delta that are now maybe. Um, so the lake does change. Our knowledge of the lake changes. One of the great things about the regulatory documents that we have is that there are provisions for additional controls. There are provisions for 4.8 miles of contingency areas. That would bring our dust control area to 53.4. That's one of the provisions of the stipulated judgment. And some of the other provisions of the stipulated judgment have yet to be completed. Um, one of them is the formation of the scientific advisory panel. Um, but other than that, other than the additional contingency areas in the scientific advisory panel, most of those provisions have been fulfilled. Um, even force measure has been exercised, stipulated penalties have been exercised. So we've been operating under these documents and they've been working very successfully. The incorporation of everything accumulated over time over the last quarter century for regulatory documents and our knowledge of the lake have been incorporated into these. And, and we'll talk about these in much further detail later on today. This is what Owens Lake looks like. It is a mosaic of dust control, natural lake surface, brine surface, you see areas with vegetation, you see areas with water, you see different distribution systems with water, you can see 
um, areas covered with earth or crushed rock or what we call gravel. And this is just a little mining, uh, a new wedge lifting towards Cottonwood King and First Meadows Road. That is all I have for this morning. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, as we discussed at the beginning of this, we're going to hear from the remaining two speakers and then uh, go to questions. So uh, I have next speaker as uh, uh, Mr. Valenzuela, uh, the manager of the Owens Lake uh, Dust Mitigation Group. Built 
48.6 square miles of dust mitigation have been completed. So what kind of dust controls are we talking about and what does it take? So shallow flooding is exactly what it, what it means. You, you have standing water on the surface of the ground. Uh, you, you have to maintain 75% wetness on that ground. And that 25% can be shaped any way you want it. And as you can see in the picture to the right, there's some islands for the birds there. It kind of looks like the Dubai Islands, but we got a little creative. Um, a variation of shallow flood is sprinkler shallow flood. We started using sprinklers. And as you can see here, this is a saturated soil. But from a compliance standpoint, this probably would not pass because only the standing water would get uh, achieve performance uh, compliance. The moist soil would not. So I'm talking in decreasing order or uh, descending order from uh, water demand. So then we have managed vegetation, which is another federally approved uh, dust control backum, best available control measure. And what does it take to grow vegetation uh, on a lake that received deposits uh, for thousands of years from the entire valley downstream, I mean upstream? It's the soils are very saline. It's almost impossible to grow anything unless you have you leach all of the soils, uh, all of the salts out uh, ahead of time. That requires a, a massive amount of drainage infrastructure, irrigation infrastructure, uh, to in, and t testing, salinity testing, to make sure that the soils are susceptible to actually grow any type of vegetation. We're currently allowed to grow 41 types of native types of vegetation on the lake. Very one, one of the most challenging types of dust control uh, because there's so many variables and factors. Uh, Soil characteristics play a huge role. The performance criteria is generally 37% coverage on an area on average, plus some spatial distribution criteria that is kind of challenging at times as well. well. We have brine. Brine is a subset of shallow flood. It's not a new type of backum. Brine is uh, just super saline, highly saturated uh, water with, with salt. Uh, it doesn't want to evaporate because it's so heavy and it forms a crust at times and at times it forms a liquid that doesn't evaporate. So we are measured, our performance criteria is either for the wet portions is uh, looked at like shallow flood for the crusted portions, the thickness of the crust is measured. If we fail to comply with brine, we go back to shallow flood. We can be ordered to go back to shallow flood. Uh, that's why it's a subset of shallow flood. Next is tillage. It's also a subset of shallow flood uh, dust control. It's pretty basic. It's an ancient method of mitigating dust by simply uh, creating roughness on the surface and to reduce wind speeds at the surface to avoid the saltation that I mentioned earlier in the sandblasting of the surface. The more aerodynamic roughness you have, the more effective it is. It's a subset of shallow flood because if it fails the performance criteria, you have to reflood the area. You have to flatten it and reflood it. But uh, apples to apples, cost-wise, tillage is probably the most cost-effective dust control method on the lake. We have gravel. Uh, gravel is a very effective type of dust control. We have to uh, install 100% coverage of the gravel, two inches in, in, in thickness over a geofabric. And if we don't use the geofabric, we have to put four inches of gravel thickness. The color of the gravel is approved to look as natural as possible. So how is our compliance, generally speaking, I know we're gonna get into more details later, but how is our compliance measured or their performance measured? So for managed vegetation, there's a variety of ways to measure compliance. There's sand flux, satellite imagery, and then there's ground truthing of that satellite imagery. The image to your left is a measurement of managed vegetation using the satellite imagery and the ground truthing. You're able to determine what percent coverage is in this area. We have greater than 20, it's gray. The red is bad. For shallow flood, we use uh, light detection and ranging, the short wave infrared. Uh, if the, 
infrared wave is reflected, then it is hitting a dry area. If it hits water, then it is absorbed and they're able to uh, analyze this data and determine how much standing water is actually on the surface. Tillage, very basic. Uh, it's based on uh, dimensions to determine the uh, aerodynamic uh, roughness of it. You have the furrow spacing and the furrow depth. We have to maintain specific ratios of performance. Uh, we also have clod sizes, and that cloddiness is kind of represented in this picture here. Usually happens in more clay soils as opposed to sandier soils. Gravel, uh, we use aerial photography, site inspections. You have to have 100% coverage. So I want to speak a little bit about uh, some of our efforts uh, to refine our current methods. We, the Department of Water and Power and our, and our staff, uh, our consultants, uh, have to achieve 75% wet for, for a shallow flood. But literature review and, uh, you know, data testing, excuse me, uh, laboratory testing and data analysis uh, have demonstrated to us internally here that you don't have to have 75% wet to achieve 99% control efficiency of the, we believe it might be less. So we've kind of started to test this by having different performance and different coverages to try to refine this curve with the ultimate goal of using water more efficiently for shallow flood. What are the challenges of constructing on Owens Lake? There are several challenges. Uh, climate change is one of them. 2017, we had uh, almost a record uh, snowpack year. And if you're the terminus lake of a, of a watershed, guess where the water's coming if you can't send it all down the aqueduct. And if you're having shorter winters, meaning all of your snow is in a, melt in a shorter amount of time and you don't have the capacity to convey it down to LA, then you're gonna have a runoff problem. And we have to mitigate for that by massive amounts of spreading and really strategic maneuvering of, of filling our reservoirs here in downtown. So that's a problem. If the lake floods, we're obviously gonna destroy lots of our infrastructure out there that is court mandated and legally required to stay in compliance. We have soft saturated soils all over the place. Very difficult, sometimes uh, zero bearing capacity. So it's slow going. They're very corrosive soils, so you have to use materials that are stainless steel, high density, polyethylene, uh, non-corrosive materials. So construction materials are very customized and very expensive. And then you have your wind guts. The reason we have a dust problem, if you don't strap down your electrical shelters, this happens to it. If you don't strap down your uh, connex with steel connex with material in it, it's going to roll over a few times. But again, we can't just do anything uh, we want out there. There's, you have to balance your, your different interests out there. As we started putting water on the lake, the birds started showing up. Um, there's a variety of environmental resources. There's habitat, there's public trust, valley, there's archeological resources, paleontological resources, tribal cultural resources that we have to avoid impacts to or mitigate impacts to. Picture of an arrowhead, snowy plover, just a variety of birds show up. So protecting public access and cultural resources, we work very closely with the state, the landowner, and whenever they believe that uh, the public trust has been impacted, we work with them to develop uh, features to enhance public recreation. This is a, a, an enhancement project that we did at T30, the central area. We hired architectural art, uh, designers, landscape architects. Uh, we have bird viewing areas. And since we started seeing that more, pe more and more people were being invited to the lake, we actually had to have put down some guidelines, basic rules to follow in trash cans. Kathy Bancroft is here today. We work closely with her to make sure that you know we protect cultural resources. How do you balance habitat? Well, our biologists, our whole team of biologists up in Bishop, have determined that uh, there are groupings of birds that uh, use resources in a very similar fashion and have grouped them into six guilds. 
And the resources are defined in water, the type of salinity, the depth, types of dry areas, and how much vegetation. So they've developed the habitat suitability model, which not only measures current habitat value at the lake, but it can also predict future habitat value based, value based on proposed changes. So what have we achieved to date? As Phil mentioned, and his slide pretty much represented it as he went through each regulatory order. We've done 10 capital projects completed since 2000, installed 48.6 square miles of dust control. There's 4.8 square miles of contingency. We've controlled emissions uh, to approximately 98.6 uh, a reduction, percent reduction, and dust, uh, dust emissions have, have, we've seen a reduction of 75,000 tons per year reduction on average. This is a representation, I know it's very difficult to see, um, all of, of all 10 phases, starting from phase one north, south, phase two south, three, four, five, seven, eight, we skipped the number, then we went to phase 7A because seven, phase 7 couldn't be built completely. Uh, parts of the lease were delayed and or, or, or not or denied. This was completed in 7A and then phase 9, 10 at the very end. What it looks like now compared to 1998, the Bryant Pool is blacked out because the, uh, the satellite overpass uh, did not capture it. So it just looks black right now. That's not, that's not how much water is in there. But the brine pool looks more like this even today, just standing saturated brine water. So roughly speaking, we have about 32 square miles of shallow flood, 5.8 square miles of uh, managed vegetation, about 5.4 square miles of gravel, 4.4 square miles of tillage. And we have some sand fence. Um, not much more than this is gonna be allowed because it's a limited type of uh, agreement. We have other, we have some less than backum or alternative types of backum that have been implemented at the lake because of, in order to protect cultural resources or habitat. Mm -hmm. Total cost to date is estimated at $2.1 billion, 55% of that being capital. O&M is about 18%. 21% is the cost of, of replacement water, every drop of water that is used on the lake for water conservation, excuse me, for dust mitigation is not sent to LA. And to supplement that, we have to buy that water from the Metropolitan Water District. That water comes from either Colorado River or the Northern Delta. And then we have our regulatory fees that are built in. Some of the infrastructure, um, it's not visible. You go out there, you're not gonna see all this pipe. All of this is buried. It's enough infrastructure for an entire city. If you guys have ever been to the city of Long Beach, it's 30 square miles. Well, we have 48.6 square miles of infrastructure. So possible next steps for us, obviously a lot of the infrastructure is becoming very old, so we have to replace and enhance aging infrastructure using new technologies, better ways of doing it. The early phases were quick and dirty, get it done, wet the areas, let's go on to the next. Uh, we have to obviously maintain compliance with our, our national ambient air quality standards. Uh, and we're also looking at converting existing water intense dust control methods into water efficient dust control methods. While balancing this, achieving dust performance standards, maintaining habitat, conserving water, and mitigating impacts to public trust, environmental, and cultural resources. And we're also looking to test new water efficient dust mitigation methods, which is primarily the reason why we're all here today. Uh, looking at alternative dust control methods. That's all I have. Hey, great, thank you. Um, so our third and final speaker of this session before we turn to questions will be uh, Dr. Holder, uh, a senior scientist with the uh, Great Basin District. Thank you. 
All right, good morning. My name is Grace Holder. I'm with the uh, Great Basin Unified Air Pollution Control District. I um, started working with the district back in 1990, so I'm probably the one with the most tenure um, that's probably in the room anyway, um, for working on Owens Lake. When I first started working on Owens Lake, obviously there was no dust control implementation, um, and so we were really kind of in a research and testing mode. And I'm going to be talking about some of the research and work that's been done on dust control development over time. <coughs> So I'm going to divide this into sort of three basic groups. Um, the first section is going to be talking about early dust control development on Owens Lake. And then I'll be talking about the development of the backup measures that you've been introduced to already. And then some of the other dust control measure testing that's been done on the work since dust control, the whole overall dust control project started in 2000. So if we look at the initial work that was done on the lake, it started almost 40 years ago in 1980 with the development of, or the formation of the Old Lake Dry Lake Task Force. That was a group of uh, agencies and interested parties that were, that consisted of the State Lands Commission, um, Great Basin Unified Air Pollution Control District, uh, Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, and the China Lake Naval Weapons Center, which is located down in Ridgecrest, because they were impacted by the severity of the dust storms. They used to move from Owens Lake down um, to the south, to Ridgecrest, which is about 60 miles away from Owens Lake. It, it affected a lot of their testing that they were doing. So they were an initial party to some of the work that was done on the lake bed. There was two main phases of projects that were done in the 80s as part of the Owens Lake Dry Lake Task Force. Um, and the first phase was really a series of very small little projects. It's called the West Tech Studies because it was run by a company called West Tech. Uh, 1981 and 1983, so over a two-year period, um, consisted of a whole variety of different little things. Um, sand fences of different species and different um, uh, construction. Also, vegetation, small little vegetation projects, just trying to see if you could even grow anything on Owens Lake. Leech, leech pits, um, laying different configurations of things on the surface. It was a, a kind of a wide variety of different little projects that were done. It also included some of the, chemi the first chemical stabilizer um, testing on the lake. The second phase was conducted after that. That was a little bit larger scale, um, sort of built on the first phase of the work that was done. It mostly consisted of sand fences. Um, originally, it was supposed to include six, or six linear miles of sand fence. It actually only finally uh, had about three, three miles of sand fence that were actually built and tested. And there was also some chemical stabilizing um, materials that were applied in a couple different areas on the lake um, to see how they would work. Um, and other projects that weren't tested that have been proposed in the early phases of dust control development were things like splash piles, um, trash, tires, repairing corridors, folders, all kinds of different things. Um, so I'm not really going to go into any of those. I'll just talk about more of the actual testing that's been done. And then at the bottom on bullet number three there, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the early projects that were done by the district. This was outside of the um, task force projects that were done. These were conducted by um, Great Basin back in the 80s and through the mid-90s. So this is a, a map on the right that shows the locations of the phase one and phase two work by the Owens Lake task force. Um, so the the West Tech project is shown by the magenta dot down there in the south end of the lake. That was the location of the phase one project. And then the phase two are shown in green. Um, and then you have two pictures over there on the left that show sort of the, some of the sand fences that were built. So the primary fence that was built off of Keeler is called the Keeler sand fence. And that's shown up in the north there with the arrow. Um, that was a one mile long sand fence that was built on the north sand sheet, sort of in the middle of the north sand sheet, extending from the shoreline one mile out into the lake bed. Um, it actually filled up very quickly, and so it was actually three tiers high, so that after the first tier filled up, they added another layer and then another one. So it was actually about a 12 foot dune by the time the project ended. Um, we had a similar one mile long sand fence in the middle of the lake. That's one of those two green dots sort of in the mid-lake part. And then also that's where the chemical um, surfactant test was conducted. And then there was a existing dune field on the lake bed on the south end of the lake called the Dirty Socks Dunes that are now 
uh, removed, so they're no longer there. But we had some sand fences that ring the dunes, trying to um, kind of figure out where the, the dunes were moving to and how much the sand motion was in each of those areas. So you have eight, eight short segments of sand fence that ring the dirty sox dunes. So the, the dunes themselves are the sort of the smiley face feature in the middle of the photo. Then you have the sand fences that ring around the outside. Um, one of the first projects that was done by the district um, outside of the task force was the sprinkler project. And this was done on the northern part of the lake at the north end of the north sand sheet. Um, the water for the project was uh, provided by a well that was drilled in 1989. Uh, 1990, there was uh, two production wells that were drilled up the near the River Delta called the River Site, provided wells. So there was a several mile long pipeline that was brought that brought water, water down to the northern of the north end of the North Sand Sheet, and it consisted of 150 acres of wetted area. It was wetted by sprinklers at various um, spacings and various amounts, trying to actually wet the surface in advance of predicted wind events. So it really wasn't what we call shallow flooding now, it was just a, an idea of to try to moisten the soil before the, the wind um, event was predicted and see if that would stabilize the surface. And then on the other side of that, uh, you can see in the photo here was a similar size control plot. And this was actually one of the first projects that, uh, this was the largest project by far, but it led to the so the development of what we see is shallow flooding now today. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a few slides. Um, this is some other projects that were done by the district. So there was some tillage projects sort of in the middle of the lake in the heavy clay soils that brought um, the clay clods up to the surface. So the tilling is not what, like what we have out there today with the roughness that's you know, five feet high. This was more of a uniform clod field. Um, it was about 10 acres in size in a couple different places on the lake bed. We also had the gravel projects that was done in a couple different locations, very, testing various sizes of gravel and um, different screen sizes and things like that. Um, that was the initial development of the gravel blanket measure. Um, before I get into the next series of slides talking about Backham, and you've already been introduced to Backham a little bit, I just want to sort of discuss a little bit so you have a better understanding of what it is. So Backham is, a, is, is what is required by the Clean Air Act for serious non-attainment areas. And Owens Lake is considered a serious non-attainment area. Um, and the definition of Backham is, as you can read up at the top, is the maximum degree of emission reduction considering technical and economic feasibility and environmental impacts of the control. Um, for Owens Lake, Backham measures are designed to be 99% control efficient. Um, so it's supposed to reduce the uh, particulate emissions by 99% due to the severity of the uh, amount of dust that's produced from the lake bed. Um, it has very strict performance criteria that um, allow us to make sure that it meets compliance at all times. So um, as we've already been introduced, there's the three main backup measures. There's shallow flooding. There, there are basically three different ways to cover the surface. So there's covering with water, that shallow flooding, covering with vegetation, the backup managed vegetation, and then covering with gravel. So those are the three main measures. There's modifications that are allowed for shallow flooding. So as Jaime talked about, there's the tillage with backup backup. We call it TWB squared. And then there's the brine with backup backup, also called just brine backup. Um, for the backup development, um, as I mentioned before, with the initial sprinkler project that was done in the early 1990s, the most effective part of that uh, test was actually the outflow at the end of the sprinkler pipeline. So when we weren't sprinkling the surface, we had the water was still in the pipeline. We had to put it somewhere. So we just dumped it out on the, at the end of the lake, at the end of the pipeline. And it was the most effective dust control. So that sort of led us to the initial development of the shallow flooding dust control measures. The first formal test of that was called the North Flood Irrigation Project, or the North FIP. And that was done in 1994 and 1995. It had a sister project on a clay type soil called the South FIP, or the South Flood Irrigation Project, that was done in 95 and 96. And then in the late 90s, right before they started doing dust control implementation on the lake bed, 
there was a project to sort of refine the uh, shallow flooding method, and that was called the SURF. Um, also, we liked acronyms at that point in time. So um, that was that's defined as the shallow, unconfined, recirculated flooding project. So that's the SURF project. There's also been quite a few different managed vegetation projects over time, um, starting real small scale. Um, the first one was called the Flooding and Salt Tolerance Study. And that was actually just done in our yard in Keeler. We have an office complex in Keeler. Um, and it was done with uh, salt grass that was um, harvested from different locations around the natural meadow system that ranks the shoreline areas of Owens Lake. And um, because it's all done in little pots, we call it the pot study. Um, we also have little vegetation plots that were done on the north fifth, as well as um, other areas on the north sand sheet called like the meadow enhancement study. And then we had the 20 acres and tree rows on the north end of the lake. Then after that, we started getting a little bit big. So we had the agrarian farm, which was done off of Keeler, and that was a 40 acre project. We also have the, uh, the DIVIT, another acronym, um, Drip Irrigated Vegetation Implementation Test. <laughs> Um, that was done, and that, that was actually, uh, I think, four or five um, different plots or about 10 acres in size each. So it was about 50 square or 50 acres in size. And then we had the Vegetation on Sand or the Voss uh, project that was done also um, on the North Sand Sheet. But that was uh, something that was supposed to be sort of a model of how you would transition from shallow flooding to vegetation. So it was kind of a combination type project. This is a picture of the North Fifth. Um, as you can see, it, it attracted a lot of birds. Um, and that was pretty exciting for us, as well as a lot of other interested parties on Owens Lake, especially uh, the Audubon Society. Um, and it led to, ultimately, the designation of Owens Lake as a national important bird area. Um, and it was heavily instrumented. There are some um, early PM10 monitors, as well as some other uh, monitoring devices um, on that bottom photo. So this is just a, a map that shows the test area. So it was uh, 300 acres in size for the wet area, 300 acres in size for the control area. Um, it was located up at the North Sand Sheet, kind of uh, near where the, the sprinkler project was located. Um, this is the sister project, the South Fifth. So it was done sort of in the middle of the lake in the heavy clay soil. Um, it had only two little plots that were much smaller in size than the North Fifth. Uh, because the water source was limited for the project. So the water came from an artesian well. It, was, it did not have a pump station. There's, um, uh, there's no electrical, at least at that point, there was no electrical lines out there. And we didn't have a diesel pump or anything. So the artesian well that was drilled um, as part of our hydrology studies that we were doing at the time only provided about 250 gallons a minute, which really limited the amount of water that was available and how much area that could be wetted. Uh, this is some pictures of the surf. So this is uh, uh, shallow, unconfined, recirculated flood test. Um, it was also done on the North Sand Sheet, similar to the location of the North Fifth. It was confined by two main features on the uh, northern end and the southern side. So we had the Keeler Sand Fence, which is shown on that upper photo of that long linear line that's one mile in length. And there was an, also an old wooden pipeline that produced a dune on the other side as well. So it helped confine the, the water flow laterally from side to side as you went from the shoreline outlets up in the upper part of the project, and then it was about a mile long down to the southern end of the project. And you, it was uh, done differently. So instead of just releasing water on the surface and just sort of seeing where it would go, we tried to control a little bit more. So it had the distinct lateral lines and bubblers similar to what the initial uh, shallow flooding projects look like out on the lake bed. Um, talking a little bit about some of the vegetation work, there's a picture of some of the uh, fog grass that was grown out as part of the pot study. And we also had these small little um, plots called the meadow enhancement study, just trying to grow um, mm -hmm. fog grass out on the lake bed um, in, with various different types of irrigation as well as um, not a leaching and things like that. Um, the Truro project is one of the more varied projects we had on the lake in terms of vegetation. So it not only tried to grow saltgrass, which was the main species that we were interested in before, 
Um, but also tree growth has been used quite a bit for dust control or for wind erosion in the past. So we tried to grow trees on the lake. Um, they don't grow very well because of the closeness of the high, highly saline groundwater. Um, we did actually put in a, a, a drainage system, but um, still the, the trees we get to a certain point and then they would start to die once the roots got down into that shallow groundwater system. Um, it was it was irrigated using sprinklers as well as drip line. And we also started testing um, the ability to grow shrubs out on the lake. Um, one of the larger vegetation projects that we did on the north end of the lake anyway was called the farm, the grain farm. Uh, so there's an air photo of it up on the upper left. It was a 40 acre project. Using uh, flooding as the irrigation method, it was all based on flooding in these um, panels that were built on contour, and then they were planted. So you can see some of the salt grass meadows that were, were grown out. This was in a heavy clay soil, so the idea was that it would have actually better drainage because the clays on our Owens Lake are heavily cracked. So the cracks actually provide water drainage for the soils. And it was also some of the first time we got to use heavy equipment on the lake and um, and we actually sort of did our initial tillage tests and, and ripping of the soils. Uh, here's some pictures of the divot that were done also on clay soils, looking at different ways to grow grass um, with drip irrigation as well as sprinklers. Uh, then pictures of the boss. Um, this is the vegetation on sand, so as the, the picture on the lower left um, shows you, the idea of this project initially was to um, try to grow uh, vegetation in areas that were originally shallow flood. So the area was flooded with sprinklers and then leached out and then uh, planted with grass. So initially it was uh, irrigated with drip lines and then the drip lines started having issues with uh, roots and things growing into them, so we retrofitted it with um, uh, a gated pipe that would release the water into furrows. Um, so that, that's sort of the discussion of some of the backup development and some of the other work that's been done since the main dust control project on the lake started getting developed um, include the projects that are listed here. So we've got things like salt flats or salt pans. Uh, ultimately that sort of has led to the development of the brine backup method. Sand fences have been tested multiple times as well as you know, all, the way to, all the way back to the early 80s, um, all the way up into early 2000s. Um, and then moat row, tillage, um, surface surfactants or chemical dust suppressants, and then uh, various kinds of roughness elements on the surface. Um, this is a air photo here uh, on, the, on the left side that shows a seven acre area, kind of where the divot was located in the, in the middle of the lake, trying to um, develop a salt flat or dust pan type dust control measure. So the idea here is completely different than what we use now for the brine backum. And the idea here was to try to control the develop or control the uh, crystallization of salts as they would um, be concentrated through the process, um, and then ultimately end up with a stable um, halide or sodium chloride surface at the end. Um, down here on the in the box on the bottom right kind of shows you some of the salt chemistry. The salts are dominated by sodium carbonates and bicarbonates and sodium sulfate salts. And they go through quite dynamic changes based on temperature and moisture conditions. And they can be quite difficult to uh, control. And some of the, um, as they go through that phase change back and forth between hydrated and dehydrated, it can actually tear the surface and create a real powdery surface that is a dust problem. So the idea was to try to develop ultimately at the end leading up to halite, uh, which is a sodium chloride uh, salt, which is the most stable on, the, on that list. So the idea was to uh, go through a series of evaporator ponds that would concentrate the salts in the water and then ultimately try to crystallize the salts out of different phases as they um, led through the crystallizer uh, panels. We also had a moat row that was tested on the lake. Um, and this led, this was led out from a 2006 settlement agreement, so it was implemented in 2008 to 2010. So the idea was to create these sinuous lines of a uh, series of uh, berms and ditches 
uh, was usually the berms would have fences on the top, um, which is called a moat and row system. And you can see the air photo of what it looked like in one of the tests. So you have the, the main moat row features there kind of lined up um, in view there, as well as some uh, fences that kind of help divide the test area up into the two sides. Um, the tillage, so the tillage has changed quite a bit over the years. So back in the 90s, it was done more of a, as a uniform field of clods at the surface. Uh, now it's done more of a surface roughness feature as well as the clotting on the surface. Um, the, sort of the model for the current uh, way that they do tillage was based on temporary tillage that was done in 2010. So you can see this is an oblique air photo that shows several square miles of temporary tillage that was done in 2010 in part of the phase seven areas. Um, there's some also uh, photos of some of the, the largest of the tillage features that are implemented now and some of the T12 areas over on the right side or the left side of the slide as well as um, some areas off of uh, Keeler. Uh, chemical suppressants have been tested multiple times going back to the early 80s. So in 2013, DWP ran a chemical suppressant test uh, that was much more complicated and had seven different uh, chemicals that were tested on the lake and multiple replications. So that's why there's all these little um, test cells in the area that's shown on the photo. Um, it was, I think, pretty successful in the beginning, but it was an area that was impacted by surface runoff from off the lake um, that kind of put an end to the test and it hasn't really been picked back up yet at this point. Um, getting into roughness elements, uh, the, the district has a project that's up off the lake bed. It's called the Keeler Dune Project. So if you look at the photo over on the left side, um, the area that's shown in brown color there, that's the Keeler Dune Project area. It's up above the the shoreline. So you can see the shallow flooding area that's on the lake bed um, down in the bottom part of the photo. Um, and then you have the Keeler Dunes project. So the idea of the Keeler Dunes project is we're trying to uh, reestablish the vegetated dune system. And in order to do that, we have straw bales have been placed on the surface and sort of a natural, natural vegetation type pattern. So it's more random and it's not in the regular array. You can see in the air photo on the top. And then associated with that, we've got native shrubs that have been planted. So the idea is as the straw bales provide the initial control mechanism on the surface to control the sands, um, it allows the, the plants to establish and then ultimately the straw bales deteriorate and the plants take over. Uh, we've also tested engineered roughness elements out on the lake bed. So the air photo over on the left side there shows a test area that was done in what's called a cell that's called T26. So that's 100 meters by 100 meters square area. It has about a thousand of these gray, solid gray buckets or tubs that are out there um, held down to the surface by adding soil on the inside. So there's something that can be picked up pretty quickly if need be. Um, that was a, a test that was run in 2014 and then 2016, so in two different locations. Um, and then, oh. <laughs> uh, and then we also have done some uh, wind tunnel testing of porous elements. Porous elements are more efficient um, at controlling sand motion and movement on the surface and the solid elements that really eliminates a lot of the scouring mm -hmm. issues that we have around the edges of the bales or edges of the elements. Um, and then down here on the photo that's up the bottom, this is a test that was done at Mono Lake and these are testing the porous elements, set of wind tunnel size elements. These are a meter high in, in size, meter uh, cubes. Uh, so some of the modifications that have been done to back them over the years. So there's only been one change to gravel. So we have the three backings across the top. So the change in gravel was just a change in the thickness that's allowed. So originally the development of back them required a four inch thick layer of gravel. Um, and it didn't have any kind of geotextile fabric underneath. Uh, when DWP started actually implementing gravel on the lake bed, they put 
put the geotextile fabric underneath because there was concerns of gravel sinking into the soil below. So uh, recognizing that, the, in 2013, the thickness of gravel was changed to allow just a two inch thick layer of gravel provided there was that geotextile fabric underneath. Some of the changes that have been made to vegetation over time um, is primarily the vegetation cover. So originally it was 50% cover of vegetation, originally just saltgrass over the surface on every acre that it was implemented. Now it's recognized that you probably don't need 50% cover. Instead, it was modeled after what the, the first dust control project the city implemented on the lake for vegetation uh, was in 2006. And that was 37% cover on average over the whole area, but it had different spatial distributions. So we applied that and allowed that um, as a modification to the backup in 2011. And then there's been various species that have been added over time. So instead of just having salt grass um, is the only species that was allowed. Now there's 42 different species of native plants that are allowed on um, the managed vegetation control measure. And then shallow flooding has had the most change. So the first changes there were to allow ramping of the, um, of the water use on the, within the shallow flood areas, both in the early part of the dust season as well as the late part of the dust season. So the dust season starts in October and goes to the end of June. So originally it was October 1st through June 30th. Now it's October 16th through June 30th. Um, and the ramping allowed the, the ramping allowed a reduction in the amount of water during the highest evaporation times of the year in the fall as well as in the spring. Hey Carly, this is Scott Tyler. We just lost our, our video feed of the monitors. We've uh, we lost it in the room as well, <laughs> and we're working on fixing that. Thank you for letting us know. Okay, sorry. <clears throat> this is not too painful.
Okay, I believe we're about to uh, get back to the presentation. So hopefully you're seeing all this activity on the screen. Um, for those of you who are remote. We're not seeing anything yet. Okay, let, let's wait for the application to come up and then, uh, and then we'll see. Hi, this is Tamara, NAS in DC. I don't think that the screen is being shared, so we uh, are. We're still loading the application. Oh, so, okay, okay, okay. Uh, I'll let you know as soon as we have PowerPoint showing on the screen. Huh. And we do now. But. Okay, so you shouldn't see it just yet. <clears throat> Is it sharing? No, I okay. We're gonna do that at the Well I think we're back up here in the room, but I'm not sure the Yeah. The I think we'll need to proceed and uh, those of you on the line please bear with us. Uh, and we'll probably need to get this rectified at the, at the questioning period. So, and I'm almost done anyway. Yeah, right. Thank you. Um, so we talked a little bit about the shoulder ramping that was allowed as part of the 2006 settlement agreement. Other changes have been what's called dynamic water management, uh, which is um, the ability for the dust control season to be shortened even further. Uh, beyond the ramping in certain areas. Um, and then there's also the brine vacuum, which we talked about, as well as the TWP squared, which are other modifications to shallow flooding. So this is the dynamic water management. So as I said before, the, the main dust season now is October 16th to June 30th. So that's eight and a half months um, in time. Uh, there's three other modified dust seasons that are allowed in certain areas on the lake that allow the dust season to be shortened even further. So the first one is October 16th, so I have the same start date, um, and then it can end on April 30th, so it's only six and a half months long. The second one is even shorter, it's only five months long, and it starts December 1st and goes through April 30th. And then uh, the last one is only three and a half months long, and that was uh, starts on January 16th and ends on April 30th. 
And the reasoning behind those are is we looked at the historic sand plus information that was done um, through monitoring over a long period of time on different sources on the lake. And a lot of those areas of where we had applied the dust season for the whole length of time weren't actually emissive for that whole period of time. So we tried to narrow down the length of time where controls actually, actually had to be implemented on the surface. So um, as of now, there's uh, 13 square miles of area that are allowed for dynamic water management. That's about 37% of all those shallow flood areas. And they're shown in different colors um, on, the, on the map here in the, the sort of the yellowish color, the red and the blue, indicating the different lengths of dust season. Uh, the brine, we talked a little bit about before. So it's uh, a measure where some of the water that's being applied on the surface can be replaced by either a thick evaporite salt crust or a thick what we call capillary salt crust. Uh, it still needs to meet the overall cover requirement based on the shallow flood wetness cover curve. So if it's a 99% control area, it needs 75% cover. But that 75% cover can be a mix of these three different surfaces. So it can be a, a mix of the water. Uh, it doesn't have to be briny like that. It can be any kind of water um, because the water provides the uh, control, not necessarily the salt content. Um, then the evaporite surface, um, as well as the capillary brine crust. And then we've talked about the TWB squared, so it's just a modification of shallow flooding that allows the area to be tilled. It has to meet certain roughness criteria for the ridge height and ridge spacing, as well as the cloud cover that produces a, a surface armoring effect. So that's the end of my presentation. Okay, so let me invite all the speakers up. Let me just make a brief note in time. Um, and uh, I thank all the speakers for uh, staying within there a lot of time for presentations as we went through this. Uh, what I'm going to do is still um, uh, allow 15 minutes of uh, panel question time because I think probably a lot of questions arose. We'll then uh, eat into our lunch time. Um, and so uh, the two remaining speakers before lunch uh, will still uh, keep you to your uh, scheduled lengths of presentation. And with that, uh, I'm going to open up the questions. I'm going to take the liberty of asking the first question as the chair, but I'd ask uh, panel members to put up their 10 cards. If you could keep track, I saw Scott and Ted, then uh, Greg. So um, at as I thought about uh, the Bacum uh, and the control effectiveness assigned to the Bacum, and this is directed at anyone who wants to answer this, um, typically it's given as a single control effectiveness, 99% effective, 95% effective. But especially for those uh, control measures that are not shallow fl flooding, how exactly do we evaluate that? Is it only at the wind conditions that are likely to lead to an exceedance of, of the National Ambient Air Quality Standard? Is it 70 miles an hour? Is it overall wind conditions over a typical year? How do you evaluate a BACM and its control effectiveness? So the 99% control requirement is the effectiveness for the entire project and area, and that was the standard for BACM. The effectiveness you can only, you'd have to know the potential of emissions, which a lot of times you can't do. Um, in natural situations until certain events. Yeah, and maybe if you could uh, hold on to the mic there. Sure. Test, test, test. Hello? Yes, great. So the emission potential from a certain area can vary over time, different times of the year, and the emission potential more or less. The You would have to determine what you needed to reduce those emissions to a certain point to prevent violations at the shoreline. There's also contributions and it's complicated. So you have potential, yeah, and I'm trying to understand the complications, right? So, so you have the potential emissions, which presumably would be associated with a certain pattern of wind conditions over the, over the course of a typical model year or typical year. So the control efficiency, I think, to establish that would have to be overall times, overall possibilities of those emissions. Okay, so so you have the potential emissions which are established based on that pattern of an entire year of wind conditions, 
and then 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 to be a backum it needs to achieve a certain percentage from those potential emissions correct and not just the annual vote okay yeah. all right all right i think i understand um, so let's go through the questions, starting with Scott. Yeah, this one's primarily uh, directed towards Phil. Uh, you talk about this shoreline of 3,600 feet above mean sea level. With the recent severe drought that you guys had here, probably the effects in the groundwater hydrology are yet to be felt on the lake surface. Plus, we don't know what the future holds as far as rainfall in the area. How how long do you think that 3,600 foot shoreline is going to remain? Forever. <laughs> it's a simple answer. And the reason why is because that's the shoreline that's written into the law. It, the lake level has always changed, and you know Grace could talk a lot about the hydrology if you have specifics on those. But the regulatory shoreline is established because that's what the lake level was at the time the water was diverted. So that's the lake level then that needs to be controlled because that's where it started to change as the factory was exporting water south. So that's that. not the current level of the brine pool? No, the current level of the brine pool was 3555. How long do you expect that to be maintained? Well, there's a lot of things that can influence that. Um, groundwater pumping under Owens Lake could change yeah. that instantaneously. The lake itself still doesn't know, a lot of the lake doesn't know that the lake is gone. So there's artesian pressure up to the old lake level. A lot of those seeps and springs um, change over time. There's some that respond um, quickly to changes in precipitation and some that seem delayed. It's a very complicated system in a large geographic area. You got anything to add to that, Grace? Uh, it is a pretty complicated system. Uh, the to 100 foot elevation, I think, is you know, uh, sort of a, essentially a concession on, on the district's part that allows them to only meet the standard at the shoreline and above, the historic shoreline and above. They don't need to meet the M10 standard on the lake bed itself. So it, it, I think it's something that's been made in place. How about the brine pool? Well, the, Is that potentially changing? The, the brine back of measure is actually sort of modeled off of the the brine pool itself, so there may be less water in the brine pond over time, uh, but I think it'll remain stable because it's going to be uh, consisting of, you know, a real thick evaporative uh, salt crust. It, they've actually got salt mining that's done in the southern part of the brine pond, um, and I, because of the evaporation rates too, it's probably not going to change that much. It's very low evaporation rates off of the, the standing water in the brine pond. <clears throat> Okay, let's move on to Ted's question. I'm going to cut off the questions with those that have their 10 cards up at this point. So, two related questions, probably primarily for uh, Dr. Holder, but uh, others as well, is one, how predictable are the uh, events, the um, exceedances or near exceedances at this point? And, you know, you talked about, um, I think, sprinkling sort of as uh, which I have a dynamic of it. Um, control you might do before an event. So I'm just curious on those two is how predictable are the events? And are there any if the wind events themselves are very predictable. Um, I would also put the related amounts of um, uh, PM10. PM10, yeah, that's less predictable. Uh, the areas that were the most frequent and the most predictable in terms of the sources on the lake bed were the first ones that were controlled, so like the North Sand Sheet area um, and then some of the areas on the southern end of the lake, those were controlled first because they were the most predictable, most frequent, and easiest to identify. The other areas, and one of the reasons that you've got the sort of the piecemeal approach for implementation of the dust control areas is that some of the areas are much less frequent. They may only be up under certain weather conditions and they're, um, they're, so they're less predictable. Um, I think at this point in time, though, we've got essentially most of the important dust control areas controlled, so we're seeing a little bit of the periphery areas below, um, but we haven't actually seen much in the way of exceedances from those areas at the shoreline. And in terms of controls that you might put dynamically in place, would you start to I think there is a potential role for that, um, and that's one of the things that we're maybe interested in looking at with the panel. And looking at um, you know using some kind of alternative dust control measure that can be done temporarily in certain areas that might open up outside of the current project 
um, so they wouldn't have to be ordered and wouldn't necessarily have to have a backup measure implemented on them. And you seem to have done that at one point uh, with sprinkling, right? Before, or was that not? That was the first initial uh, idea was to use sprinkling to moisten the surface in advance of um, wind events. It didn't work very well where we implemented it because it was a real sandy soil, so it would dry out too quickly. Uh, there might be potential for looking at it in other areas. Okay, Greg. Um, one, uh, uh, I, have, I have several questions, so I want to be judicious here. Um, one thing that, and I guess this is for Dr. Holder, um, one thing that wasn't clear is how much annual maintenance do these things require? So one of the, our, our charge is sure <laughs> and reliability. Um, and uh, it would be nice to have an idea of when you have to till, how often you retill, when you have to. Yeah, I think that's more of a question for the <laughs> I'll go ahead and do my best, but Jennifer Wong here, uh, manager of Owens Lake Operations, is going to do a presentation. The next, the next one. All right. All right. Um, in the interest. So, okay, then the, on, the, on the topic of durability and reliability then, um, my other big concern is about all the things, the temporal period though, right? We're expected to have massive snow years and years with no snow at all, right? Um, and so one of the questions is, um, which, and it seems like the biggest problem is that actually a major flood event could actually wipe out a huge amount of work, right? So uh, which are the most effective controlled measures to that kind of event? Yeah, give us one a shot um, because we've been through this twice now. In 2017, we had the emergency snowmelt runoff, and then again this year. Um, the infrastructure elements, they can all be impacted differently. The uh, extreme flooding actually provides dust control because the lake's wet, and that would actually take a long time to dry down, and we saw that in 1969. The piping can float and break. That could be a problem. The berms can be breached. That'd be a problem for shallow flooding. A lot of the vegetation would probably die. Um, a lot of the gravel, especially on the inner area or the lower elevation parts of the lake would be inundated and submerged and would vanish and would be required to put back out there. So um, each back them differently. Some of the brine areas could maybe never be reestablished because it's a freshwater influx. Um, and definitely all of the tillage areas would be obliterated and smooth. And then last, Question again, it's not a question about variability. Talks about certain clay surfaces and certain sandy surfaces, right? So, can you give us an idea of which of these backings work best and which uh, kinds of soil textures? Um, I'll just give a shot at, uh, at that response here. Um, what we see is a tillage works best in clay soils, you get a lot of clottiness. It is also effective in uh, sandier soils, but you don't get the cloudiness, and cloudiness is a, is a performance criteria. Um, with managed vegetation, we see sandier soils with high percolation rates. Um, some of the clays have sand in them. Uh, those uh, soils that are porous enough to reclaim the soil, leach all the soils out through our drainage, subsurface drainage systems. If an area gets hit with water to try to reclaim and, and it just stands on the surface, you're not going to leach those, uh, those salts out. You'll never be able to grow any managed vegetation there. Um, some areas historically have had more saltier water. Uh, they've been a historic brine sump. So to try to make that area a brine area uh, over time is, is probably our best shot. Uh, to try to establish brine in a fresh area, in a fresh water area, nearly impossible. So the, the lake kind of tells us what it wants. Putting gravel in an area with extremely soft, saturated soil is very difficult. Contractors usually have to go in a, a swirling direction and they create the path for themselves to be able to put equipment on there. Um, the, the closer you get to the brine pool, the softer the soils are, the more saline the soils are. So you want to keep your vegetation away from the brine pool. You want to keep your freshwater ponds away from the brine pool. And freshwater ponds are important because uh, the birds like fresh water. Salinity is a huge factor for maintaining habitat uh, across the lake. I don't know if you want to add anything, Bruce. I don't think you covered it really well. Thank you. Um, Nusha. 
Uh, actually, interestingly enough, uh, David and Scott and Greg covered uh, most of my questions, but I, I think one of the main questions I had was on how these different uh, that can look sort of respond to a rain event or a storm event. But you actually you mentioned in 1969, how long did it take for the water to sort of for the lake to go back to being a dust bowl and having an issue? And the reason I'm asking is maybe that then you can sort of add to that is um, we do often have these uh, extreme uh, wet years, and they're not every 50 years, but actually they happen more than every 50 years. So I'm wondering how they can be potentially used uh, rather than sort of adding a lot more cost to preventing them. From so sort of how can you use them as an adaptive measure rather than um, you know, a disaster that's not going to happen? Uh, I can use a say a few things. <clears throat> uh, during 2017, uh, we maximized uh, the pond levels on our shallow flood areas uh, in order to mitigate any excess runoff into the brine pool. Um, we that was the only real way we could use that water. The rest of the water was being spread in the valley. We had an we had an excess. Um, Let's see. To use that water creatively for dust mitigation, maximizing our brine. Oh, some of the tillage areas were taken out of service. We turned them back to shallow flood. Uh, we deferred the use of dynamic water management, which is the ramping down periods. That's the only way to maximize our pond levels. Um, but really, it doesn't uh, create a situation where um, we can use it for long term use. Uh, I, I don't see where we could we could do that. I don't know if you want to add anything. So. Um, just for the brine pool question in 1969 and the dry down, I don't think it was until the 80s that we started seeing the really big storms. But you know, every year is different. So you know, there was a long drought in the 70s. There were some large El Nino events in the early 80s. So and the tree rings and the bristle cones tell us what we've seen in the last 500 years is nothing like the last 4,000. So. It's hard to say, but if the brine pool is elevated, like we were expecting 200,000 acres in 2017, and um, we'd probably be looking at a very similar lake today if that had happened. Yeah. And then one other question I had for you was uh, uh, in your conclusion, Philip, you had the uh, slide 22 that you sort of had the own like annual tons of potential PM10, and you can see significant drops. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm hoping that we can get the numbers for 2015, 17, 18, but right now it's a, it's a fascinated. And I can totally see that the, the, it's so high that potentially we cannot see the impact of uh, water year in here. Right. Uh, but I don't, I wonder if we zoom in with smaller numbers, is there a way to can, you can see like as you go through what your so draw years? Because I'm really curious during the current the current drought, the 2012-2015, how these numbers have fluctuated for have they at all? Yeah, they definitely have, and there's it's not a single variable, and it's not so simple because a lot of times our um, wetter years are the more emissive years, and it's because of the precipitation and how that changes the surface of the soil versus the drier years where it actually becomes crusty and less emissive. So in longer droughts. Um, so there's not that real simple relationship all the time. Okay. 